Okay, so let's move on to the very heart of Qt to C++. We're extremely honored to have with us today a leading C++ authority, an author, and the chair of the ISO C++ Standards Committee. And also a native language architect at Microsoft. So here to tell you about modern C++, let's welcome Herb Sutter. Give a round of applause for Herb Sutter. I apologize in advance for not wearing a Hawaiian shirt. See, I don't always wear them. Uh, first of all, thanks very much to the cute folks for inviting me to come and speak to you today. I hear you've been having a great conference. How many of you are C++ developers? <laughs> so we're among friends. Is it okay if I show a little C sharp later? I promise it'll be brief, and we'll turn it into C++ very quickly. Uh, but seriously, I, I, just to level set, we have a limited time, and uh, the thing I want to talk with you about is not standard. It is not going to be standard anytime soon. I want to be very clear with you. This is a project I'm working on personally. So yes, I'm the chair of the ISO C++ committee. I am not speaking in that capacity. I'm telling you about my own research project. It is just a research project. I'm going to show you a prototype. It'll only compile like the six examples from my paper, not all of them. The one I'm going to show you, I hope compile, that it will work. But what I hope to do is to share a direction that I hope will improve C++ if it works out quite a bit in the next coming five, 10 years. And something that also relates to you because the cute audience, and one of the reasons that I was glad to accept this invitation, is one of my targets. So, and I'm not making any, uh, uh, not speaking for the cute company itself either, but it's involved in part of the prototyping goal and it'll be one of the examples that I show. So my goal for the last a couple of years, there are so many things you can work on uh, when you're looking at evolving an uh, um, important and widely used language like C++. And so I write evolution proposals to extend the language. And I thought, you know, there's just in no time in a career to do all the things that we might want to do. So I've tried very hard to focus on just how do we make C++ simpler. Specifically, instead of inventing some great new thing and risking turning C++ into Lisp or some weird thing like that, which we don't want, how can I take the things that I already have to do as a C++ programmer and make them simpler? So the things I'm already doing just indirectly or with difficulty. None of what I'm saying is going to be possible without something that Bjarne Struistrup has he, he, hewed to very firmly for the last 30 years. Here's a movie playing everywhere. Actually, we're not going to talk about James and the Giant Peach. We're going to talk about Bjarne and the unified universe of types. And one of the things that Bjarne Struistrup took a firm stand on from the early days of C++, and by his account, he said no to hundreds or thousands of people who asked him to bifurcate the C++ type system. What that means is, it, well, we have classes, but make struct and class different things. He didn't do that. A class is just a struct with different defaults. He didn't invent a separate interface concept like, say, Java did, which, and C Sharp, which is a bifurcated type system because it's not the same kind of type. It is a different thing in the language. In C++, we have a language where we can write value types. We can write base classes. We can write interfaces, structs, functors, callable types, iterators, containers, variant, any. We can write CORBA interfaces. We can write traits. Pods, com types, enums, expression templates, all of these things are 
richly diverse. And thanks to Bjarne Strustrup, with the exception of Enum class, which we, I hope to help fold into the type system, every single one of these is just a C++ class. We have such a flexible tool in the C++ class concept that it can model so many things. The trouble is that currently we do this by convention and we do it documenting it in English and instead of in code. So the goal of my project in a nutshell is to be able to give a name, just like the names that we put up there already that we already use, but a code name, a name that is compilable. And as soon as you make it compilable, it is a word of power. To express that name that describes one of these subsets of the universe of classes that we already write, express it using compile time code with the idea that it's going to make classes easier to write. So concepts, if you're familiar with C++ concepts, which were just voted in now to the C++ 20 working draft for the next standard, they let you query types. Think of these as constructive concepts that let you define, not just say, is this an iterator? No, help me write an iterator and automate the boilerplate. So in a nutshell, the idea is I want to enable a new kind of compile time abstraction, a custom transformation from the source code you write to an ordinary class definition, nothing new. It's what we already write today, just more convenient. We already do this. So in the language today, if I write class point int x comma y, what does that do? That generates all sorts of stuff. Oh, look, I didn't say private, but X and Y are private by default. It generates a public constructor, destructor, copy and move assignment operators. So I didn't have to write all that green stuff. I just wrote class point int X, Y. If I write struct my class colon base and then a function, well, if that's a virtual function in the base class, it's automatically virtual when the compiler is done with it on the right-hand side. I have the base class be public by default because I said struct. All of these things are defaults I didn't have to write, and they're nice and convenient. We like that. The question is, instead of the compiler essentially running this pseudocode in italics, which is now expressed as English-like standard ease that you have to wait for your compiler writer to implement, what if you could write just in this one very narrow extension hook, really a compiler extension, a language extension, but not making the whole language mutable or anything, but just in this one place, write a custom named transformation from the source code to the, the actual generated type. Again, nothing too crazy, we're just interpreting in the meaning of the translation from source code to the actual class definition. I am not interested in making this a mutable language where you can define your own operators. Not interested, go find somebody else to write that proposal. I don't need to do that to get this big win. Nor am I interested in making classes mutable after the fact. This is not dynamic typing per se. It is, I, I love the ODR. Once it's defined, it's stable just like today. It's just a class. But if I could do that, then I could make my own words that are just like class and struct, because we know class and struct have many of the same rules, but a few different defaults. What if I could write me some of that as code? So everything I'm about to say, again, is experimental. That includes the syntax. So this has been brought to the Standards Committee only once so far, and that's the beginning of a very long journey where the Standards Committee will, will, will see and experiments whether this works. If it does, the Standards Committee will no doubt change the syntax because they have opinions on syntax. But for now, interpret all the syntax I'm going to show you as straw man syntax. The idea is I could have a dollar class, a meta class, and I can give it a name like interface, and in there write compile time code that says things like, oh, all functions must be public and pure virtual by default and are required to be. You're not allowed to write anything else. Oh, and you can't write copy or move operations. You can't have data members. These are pure interfaces just like C Sharp or Java, but it's just a class, and we write these by hand today already. But then instead of writing them like I do today, I could say interface, shape, so put a more specific word in the place of class. 
And the three things that you'd usually do in those compile time computations is enforce rules, like, oh, you can't have a private data member, provide defaults, like public and virtual by default are functions, and to implicitly generate functions. Perhaps you want an implicitly generated virtual destructor by default without having to write it. So today, on the left-hand side, in C17, we can write interfaces just like C Sharp and Java. We do this all the time. We even give them names like abstract base classes and we shorten it to ABCs. This is evidence we are trying to give it a name. We just can't say that name in code. It's a convention where every single one of you in the audience knows the way you write an interface in C++ is you make all functions public and pure virtual, you make sure you have a virtual destructor and that you have no data members, no copy or move assignment because that doesn't make sense, that would be slicing. You might have clone, but not a virtual clone, but not a copy or move assignment. And you can write that today and then hope it stays true under maintenance because if on the right-hand side, the future you six months later or the next intern forgets that rule and writes a private data member, what happens? It compiles and maybe blows some of the assumptions that you made for later uses of that because now you have bases at different offsets, you don't get empty base optimization and things like that. What I would like to do is write exactly the same thing as on the left-hand side, exactly the same effect more conveniently by saying the word interface shape, and then just write my functions, and they're public and virtual by default. I enforce, I didn't write anything not virtual or not public as a function. I could enforce there are no data members so that under maintenance this is more robust. Now, you might say, but what if under maintenance I meant to add a data member? That's okay. You can add a data member. As soon as you do it, you will get a compile time error because interfaces, interfaces can't contain data members. But you can still add it, but you just have to say it's a different kind of class. Change the word interface to value or something like that. This gives you the best of each world because and the way you should think of it is that the interface is a generalized opt-in. By saying the word interface, I am opting into this customizable set of behaviors that I can share as a library. Common ones like interface could eventually be put in the standard library, so you don't have to share them, but if you want to make your own, you can share those and use them as well. Here is what the code looks like. The idea, this builds on other proposals that are currently going through the committee. The first thing you'll notice besides dollar class, which I just described, is there's a const expert block. That's one of the, the syntaxes going through the committee for a generalized compile time uh, block of code that must run at compile time. And then there's compiler.require, which simply says, hey, it's like a, a static assert, but it's hooked in with the compiler, that interface variables must be empty, otherwise we'll emit an error message, and we can write what that error message is. And then for each function in dollar interface functions. So dollar interface is another proposal that's going through standardization right now that is actually much more further along and, and getting more concrete for reflection, compile time reflection. So I'm going to reflect on myself, on the class being defined that I'm being applied to, and I'm going to look at all the functions, and for each one I'm going to require it's not copy or move. Otherwise I'll say, interfaces may not copy or move, consider a virtual clone. I'm going to require, or I'm going to say if it doesn't have an access specifier, make it public, then require that it's public in case the user actually explicitly wrote something else, and then make it pure virtual. And oh, by the way, at the top you'll notice that I have also defined a no accept destructor, which is then made virtual as well. So now I've said in code what in English we talk about as an abstract base class or an interface. And the idea here is that you apply that to the code the user writes in the blue, and this is the program that when I translate that blue code the user wrote to an actual class definition, I run that program against the contents of interface shape. I make things virtual and public and so forth. One of the things I like about this 
is I didn't have to write any standard ease. It is very hard and expensive to write language wording in the standard, and it's not worth it. Like, there's no way we'd ever add interface into the standard, because why would you add 18 pages of text to describe a different thing that is separate from classes? That's just not who we are as C++, nor is it worth it to get that much to the 2,000-page standard that much faster by adding that language feature. Besides which, then you'd have to wait for compilers to implement it and so forth. Here, this implementation of interface, I can unit test. It's code. We love code. We can test code. We can share code. We can put it in namespaces, put it on GitHub. Common ones, standardize. It's just code. And we can't unit test or debug standard ease. And I'm going to make a claim. Uh, this is a stretch goal. This is one of those when you're early in a project, and again, I stress that we are very early in this experiment. You have these big vision goals before you hit reality face first, right? So you're, you're in the dreaming mode. But I have some reason to believe that the following dream is a reality, and I hope to convince you in the next three minutes. I think it is possible to express an interface this way, and compared to a language like C Sharp or Java that builds it in with the intelligence of language designers integrating it into their language, and getting first-class support for a first-class language feature built into compilers and tools. I think that this implementation can have no loss of usability, be just as usable, just as expressive, just as good error messages, and just as good performance, because it's compile time, as baking it into a language. If you don't believe me, great, because I have a demo. But in case you're wondering why I said, in case you're wondering why I said, eight, add 18 pages to C++, because that's the C-sharp language spec, which is roughly the same granularity as C++. So there is a screenshot of the actual current C-sharp spec for interface. If you have a high-res monitor and you can zoom, you can see it's which clause it is for interface, and it's 18 and a half pages. And I believe the code on the right-hand side is essentially identical in meaning thanks to leveraging Bjarne Strustrup's unified type system where everything is a class. The class concept is so flexible, it can express an interface, but today we do it by convention. We'd like to actually declare our intent. And you know what? As soon as you let programmers declare their intent to say, I want this, you can give them this one word of power as an opt-in, suddenly we can do so much for you. And I think it's the job of languages to work for programmers. Too often we say, well, the programmer can get over it and use the language as they found it. We should work on usability. As the previous speaker talked about UI, UX, the user experience of a language, is also an important thing. In C Sharp and Java, you can write the code on the left. I want to be able to write the code on the right in C++. So if this succeeds, Notice that one difference is a semicolon, because in C++ we end classes with semicolons. It's, it's a thing. It just makes us feel good. <laughs> At least that's what we tell people, and we say, like, why do I have to write that semicolon? But that we say that in private. But we can also use C++ features like const. And to give you a sense of how this looks side by side, let me actually show you. Is it okay if I show you a little bit of C-sharp code? Nobody's going to be offended? All right. So let's look at some C Sharp here in Visual Studio. And here's an interface shape with an area and a scale by. It looks very much like what I just showed you. Now let's also look at Matt Godbolt's Compiler Explorer, which happily, thanks very, Matt, very much Matt Godbolt, he has put a, an instance that runs the Clang-based proto, Clang prototype compiler written by Andrew Sutton, uh, if you've heard of Andrew Sutton, he was involved with Bjarne Strustrup and Gabriel Dosreis in Concepts. He's the guy who implemented Concepts in GCC, which is now shipping. He is also the guy who is writing the prototype Clang-based uh, Metaclasses compiler. And so Matt Godwell put it on his site. So that's what you see here. This code is basically the same as I just showed you. The compiler is in a slightly different state. So in this case, the prototype, we put the, the virtual uh, destructor last. But this is basically what I showed you before. Now, if I want to write 
interface in C++. I know how to do it, class, shape, public virtual void, blah equals zero, and I write it all by hand. Or I could, could I, I can't cut and paste code from C Sharp into C++, can I? Control C, Alt Tab, Control V, and you can expect a compiler error because why? Semicolon, error expected semicolon after meta class name. By the way, when I did this demo at CppCon two weeks ago, I don't think that was the error message. So, Andrew, I see you fixed that error message. Thank you. <laughs> semicolon. And now it compiles. Now, what does it do? I haven't even, I, and I haven't even showed you the, the actual cool part yet because you can't actually see what it did. So let me show you what it did because one of the things in our prototype compiler is in a const text for block, you can write compiler.debug to actually print the, the class uh, definition. You reflect on a, like dollar shape and then print it out. So you could reflect on any class, but it's really useful for classes you defined using a meta class so you can see what was generated. And when we do that, then, and let it compile, there is what we today write by hand. And all I did was write this code, and I get this written. And this is important because we're going to need tools to show us this. This is an abstraction. We're going to need tools to show us what gets generated. But that's just C++. This is my proof to you that I am not inventing some weird new language with a new kind of class. No, I'm just giving, trying to give you, a, and myself, frankly, a more convenient way of writing the classes, the rich C of different classes, the subsets of this C of classes that I already write today, that you already write today. But we express them as by convention. Now, one of the things about this is that, of course, I mentioned error messages. Remember a few slides ago? I said on the right-hand side, the goal is no loss in usability, expressiveness, error message quality, or performance. So you probably believe me on performance because you just saw, okay, at compile time, I just generate this class I would have written by hand. It's just more convenient. Therefore, I know at runtime it's going to be exactly as performant as if I'd written it by hand. So you probably believe me on performance. We're still making sure that the compile time performance scales. That's part of the research but the runtime performance is fine. But what about diagnostic quality? Because Visual Studio and C Sharp are known for usability and for having very good error messages. So that, for example, if I create a data member here, oh, I'm not allowed to do that. Notice the red squiggle if I hover over it. Error, interfaces cannot contain fields, which was they called data members in C Sharp. Well, that's a pretty good quality error message. What happens if I do the same thing over here? If I say int i, and then we let Godbolt automatically refresh and do a live compile. Error, interfaces may not contain data members. Mm, I think that's, a, that, that's equal. Would we call that equal? Yeah, okay. Maybe the word fields is shorter than data members, but we're C++, we can take a couple of words. We, we don't mind compound nouns. But another kind of problem that I might have is that, say in C Sharp, instead of doing that, I instead made the error of having a private method. No colon in C Sharp. Ah, notice I'm getting an error. What's the error? The modifier private is not valid for this item. Okay, can we do as good as that? Let's try if I say private with a colon in C++. In C++. Error interface functions must be public. Now compare that to the C sharp method, the uh, error message. I'll say that in this particular case, our prototype gives a better error message than C sharp does. Now, the .NET compiler people, are, if they see this, the Visual Studio folks will say, oh, let, let's, we can easily make that a nicer error message because we know about interfaces, they're baked into the language in C Sharp, so it's easy to have just as good an error message. But the interesting thing to me is, I think with C++, if meta classes work out, we'll generally get 
better error messages than languages with baked-in features of the same thing, and here's why. If you are a compiler writer, how many of you have ever been a compiler writer or known a compiler writer? Okay, a few of you. What do we do all day long? We're boring people. We just translate grammar. That there is telling you something about the grammar. This grammar element is not valid in this grammar position which you can figure out what it means, but it gives you the mostly generic error message because that's the natural thing you write as a compiler writer. You have a set of generic messages like you can't put this grammar element here. Whereas if I am writing the meta class, and of course they could add something specific to interfaces because they know about them, but if I'm writing a meta class, I am naturally thinking about it. I'm the guy who's writing interface and here's a requirement. What's the message I give if you violate it? Oh, well, I naturally, like I'm talking to you, say, well, interfaces can't have data members. Here's another example of that. What if instead of that example, um, interface functions must be public, same thing. What if I actually try to write a copy constructor now what I get as an error message, that's not possible in C-sharp, right? But the error message, as you already know because you saw the code, that's the nice thing about code is you can read it and know what it does, but you know it's going to say, interfaces may not copy or move, consider a virtual clone. So it's not just, that's illegal, it's very natural for me, as I'm writing this meta class, to give advice to give a high quality error message with advice. Now, when I first wrote this code over a year ago, I was not actually planning this demo. It's just what fell, came out of my fingertips. Because, well, I know, no, you can't copy or move. Like, what you probably want is a virtual clone function because that's polymorphic. And that'll also give you the copy you want but with the right virtual semantics. That's the idiom. So you just naturally write it. Gives you nice high quality error messages because you're thinking about the advice that you're giving users. So I think, I have reason to believe that my pipe dream of expressing interface in a few lines of code will have no loss in usability, expressiveness, diagnostics, or performance than expressing them as standard ease or baking them into another language compiler. But I want to give at least one more example because this is not just about interfaces. In C++, we have value types, and we can talk about regular types and whether regular, the, the computing concept, also means uh, comparable. Let's just not have that discussion before the bar, but for now, just say, let's, let's say it means comparison to. So today, I have to write the code shown on the, the left, and notice I have to write not only the comparison functions, I still get copying for free with class, which is great, Think of class and struct as the first two meta classes, so they, they run a little program and they give me copying for free. But do you notice the first red line? Why do I have to reinstate the point default constructor? Why, why don't I just get that by default? Anybody? Ah, because there's a user-defined constructor. So because I put the point int int constructor, that suppresses the generation of the default constructor. How many of you have enjoyed that? And so I have to reinstate it. But the reason for this is because class is a one-size-fits-all program. The defaults we picked for class have to be true for every class, whether it's an iterator, callable, struct, base class, interface, com type, or any of these rich, diverse things. You get one set of heuristics because we have only one name. As soon as you have another name, value, you can attach to that word of power all the defaults and generated functions you want. In this case, notice that I've gone as far as saying, and frankly, I like this idea. You may not, the standards committee may not. I like that data members should be private by default and functions should be public by default. That's what we tell people anyway. Can we stop just telling them and make it the default? And don't worry, this is C++, you can still opt out and, and, write, and do it differently. But the way I decided to write my value a meta class, which I'll show briefly on the next few slides, and I'll let you read it in detail on your own, but it will go through, make data members private by default, functions public by default, it will give you comparison, and 
if you didn't write it yourself, we'll provide the defaults. It will give you a default constructor, even if you wrote your own constructor, and why does it know that? Because a regular type is default constructible. Therefore, I know, because you wrote value, that you want this rich set of things, including you want a default constructor. So I don't have to guess anymore with a heuristic that's one size fits all for all possible classes you may want to write. I know you're writing a value. So think of meta classes also as a way of making a word of power that is a bundle of defaults. It is a generalized opt-in where I can make a single word stand for this set of opt-ins that I want. Here is the basic idea. I, I can write the default copying and f functions and constructions functions that I want. For every variable, I reflect on the type, that, the source type I was given. For every variable, I make it private if there's no access specifier. For every function, I make it public if there was no access bar specifier. And I require that there are no protected or virtual functions because, well, a value type is going to copy. If you have protected members or virtual functions, you're going to slice, and that's probably not what you want. So you don't have to put in those requirements. If they don't matter for you, you can write a value meta class that doesn't have those. But this is a safety net. Why not make our language easier to use and safer at the same time and more robust under maintenance? So we just can't make those errors. And if in the future we do want to add a virtual function, we can simply say, OK, yeah, we're not a value anymore, and just opt into the thing we now want to be but we've made it clear and it's self-documenting. So now I can just write what I said, and I can construct a point from two integers, I can copy construct it, I can equality compare it, I can less than compare it, so I use it as a set key, and all of those things work, but I get them by default without having to write it. How many of you have used Qt Mock? <laughs> it's a wonderful tool. So, I, I know that's a controversial statement, and I know it because I created two cute mocks. I'm the lead designer of C++ CLI at Microsoft, and I'm the lead designer of C++ CX, both of which are non-standard extensions written for the same reason as cute mock, because C++ is not today powerful enough to express the things we need to express. It doesn't have reflection, doesn't have properties, doesn't have many of the things that we need to, the abstractions that we need to be able to express. And part of my goal with meta classes is I never want to write C++ CX again. Life's too short. <laughs> no, it, it really is. I would like to enable you to write it, or to one person to write it, or a team to write it as a library and ship it without waiting for a major new compiler, and then it only works on that one compiler. You know, that's how it goes. So I'll use the cute mock example briefly. We have a source file that includes extensions. We run it through the mock compiler and the regular C++ compiler, and then we generate stuff and it comes all together. I would like to make that the normal, the, the normal linear build system, build chain, to be able to express all of what we express with those extensions in C++. Now, I am certainly not, since I'm talking to a Qt audience, I am not speaking for Qt that this is ever going to happen. This is my goal, one of the things I explicitly want to enable. So uh, one or two of the folks at the Qt team are helping me in their spare time, and we're going to try over the next year with the prototype as it continues to evolve to see if it might be possible. And then if it is, maybe in some future years you can make some decisions based on that, but it's way too early to even speculate about that. I'm only stating a personal goal for an experiment, so just please take that big caveat. But what I would like to do is to be able to, instead of say, oh, I've got explicitly got to inherit from Q object, but that's not enough, because I also need a macro for Q object to put some boilerplate in. And yes, I know there's, extent, there's variations that avoid mock, but they just add the same stuff another way. So if, if you are using a substitute for mock, that's fine, but they're just doing all the same stuff in a different way and pushing around where the extra information goes. Instead of saying all that, I'd like to be able to say Q class. And if I could say Q class, it should be very easy to say, well, of course, every Q class implicitly inherits from Q object. Why should I have to write that on every class? Of course, it does whatever the stuff in the Q object macro does. For a property, 
I, there is a, another meta class. If you want to look for the details, check out my paper, P0707, which is, uh, I've blogged about it in July on herbsutter.com, and you can also find it on the Standards Committee papers. It goes into more detail on what these are. But property also is a templated meta class which says, here is a scope. You can write a value and a get and a set function, and we'll inject that into the enclosing scope. But if you don't, if you just write an empty one, an empty property into value by default has an integer, will generate one if you didn't have a data member, will generate a get function if you didn't have one, and will generate a set function if you didn't have one. So my goal is for the code on the right-hand side to be exactly equivalent to the code on the left, including the extra information that the runtime system needs to be able to do stuff with it, like generating the appropriate metadata. This is a stretch goal, this is a big thing, and so we're taking baby steps and trying to validate bits and pieces of it. I hope that we can build to being able to do that. It's the same as I mentioned with C++ CX that I'm responsible for, sorry, but there was, it, it was necessary, we felt, to have a language extension. You have a header file with extension, it goes through a specialized compiler that has non-portable extensions. I would like to write portable C++ code, please. I've always wanted that. I just couldn't write it in the language before to express COM interfaces, to express COM properties and the weird kind of inheritance that's sort of allowed in the new version of COM that's been since Windows, Windows 8, and be able to generate the WinMD files with all the metadata that it tells you about those things. Because if you didn't like what I did and you said, why don't we just do the classic COM way where I didn't have to do as much violence to my C++ source, that just means you have to write the extra information in a separate file, an, an idle file that gets run through a separate compiler, a middle compiler. We put it in the language because we thought maybe it's simpler to have a single build chain, but no matter which way you go, having to put extra information somewhere, having extra compilation knowledge outside the language that's not portable is just not great. And so one way of looking at this, instead of writing the left-hand side to be able to write something much clearer, one way of looking at this is saying, I, I, we have seen the C++ community. They are doing these things anyway because they need to, but the standard has not been helping them. And I think that when we've been watching people suffer for a decade or two or three, doing things by hand or in a very difficult way, we have a responsibility as language designers to at least try, we might still fail, but to at least try to help you do what you're already doing. That gives us two things. First, it tells us that we're not turning C++ into some other language. We're already doing this stuff as C++ developers. We just want to do it more easily. We can all get behind that, I hope. And we, we love what we can already do, help us do it even better. And second, it gives us a great set of existing use cases to validate as we try out examples with meta classes. Can they do this? Can they do that? And it's a, a built, ready made set of use cases. You don't have to invent examples. They're all across the industry already. So the goals are to expand our abstraction vocabulary beyond class instruct and union and enum, which are the only kinds of classes and leverage the generality of the class to be able to use the class to express all these rich things. You can also use these to write compiler-enforced coding standards, hardware interface patterns. So for example, one, uh, in one usability study I did, uh, you always discover everybody says they could use it, for, and they all give a different reason in their current projects. One of them said enforce a coding guideline. One said we have to use a hardware interface library where we're, we are interfacing with hardware, and that interface library requires that our classes be written a certain way. Today we enforce that by coding standards. When we get it wrong, things break and it's harder to debug. It would be nice if we could write it once and just use it and then encode review and force it. It's less work to write, it's easier to keep right. That's the kind of thing we'd like to enforce and eliminate the need for side languages and compilers like the one I'm responsible for. Benefits for users, be able to have these things without waiting for a new compiler, share them on GitHub. And benefits for standardization is if we can do this and have more things like interface and value as libraries instead of as language features, well, that will help us to standardize better and faster. 
as well, because the common things, just like with classes, the common meta classes should go in the standard library for everybody to use the same one and have that convergence. So those are some thoughts. It's a, an experimental research project, but one that I think has enough value. We talked about ROI. There's risk, but the reward is high enough that it is worth taking a serious run at this, and so that's what I'm in the process of doing. If I fail, it will be glorious. It will be a glorious failure. I really hope that doesn't happen, but let's check back in a few years and we'll find out. But I hope that it will help all of us, whether we're in using Qt, whether we're using Windows, whether you're using Linux, Mac, whether we're writing embedded systems or IoT, to use this language we already love that has a very long future because the idea of being able to control exactly where your data goes and to write efficient code that takes full advantage of the hardware will continue to get more and more important as our devices get smaller and more diverse all over the world. So I think this positions us well in a well-positioned language, and I, I hope that you find benefit from it. And thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference today. <laughs>